In this video, we're going to be talking about what voltaic cells are and how you calculate cell potential. So, to get to, before we get started here, let's talk about spontaneous reactions one more time. So, what does spontaneous mean? Spontaneous means that it's a reaction that just happens on its own. And so, not all reactions are spontaneous, but in the case of the example we have here where we have zinc and copper ions placed into solution, uh, when we put the zinc into the copper solution, you notice that over time what happens here is it, is it starts to build up this black soot like solid on the, on the zinc metal. And so that suggests that there is a reaction taking place. If you notice the color of the solution in the right beaker, the color is definitely lighter than what it was initially. So that's also an indicator that a reaction is taking place. So what exactly is happening here? We, what we see here in the pictures below the two beakers are the copper ions themselves are actually going in and replacing the zinc metal atoms and as a result you're forming copper solid and zinc ions are being, are being formed in the solution. So that black soot that you see there is actually copper being deposited on the surface and so this is a spontaneous reaction. Now if we were to take a zinc solution and we would put a copper metal in it, nothing would happen because that would be a non-spontaneous process. And so as we look at this and we study the, the electrons and how they tra transfer from one metal to the other, there's, a, there's definitely a, a charge that's going to be given off from this reaction and that's one of the things we're going to be looking at. So. So voltaic cells are also called galvanic cells. You'll hear me say galvanic oftentimes along with voltaic, but they're basically the same thing. So what exactly is a, a voltaic cell? A voltaic cell is, is basically a battery that's set up in a way to where you have two different metals and they're set up in a configuration to measure a charge. You can see the picture here on the right hand side where you have two different beakers connected together and as they're connected together a voltmeter is connected to them and you can see that there's a there's a voltage being measured there so we're going to be looking at what a voltaic cell is uh, in, in detail over the next couple slides so what exactly is a voltaic cell all right, voltaic cells have several different parts to them, and so it obviously that you're going to have two beakers on one on opposite sides, and in those beakers you're going to have, let's say for example we're talking about the copper and zinc. So on the right hand side you would have the copper metal, and you would have the copper plus two ion solution. So that solution you would put you would dissolve the salt copper two nitrate into it, and so these are complementary to each other. So the copper, the metal, and the solutions complementary, they go together. So that creates one half cell of the reaction of the voltaic cell. The zinc is then placed into the zinc ion solution that's on the left hand side. That is the other half reaction. When we talked about balancing redox reactions earlier, we talked about balancing using the half reaction method this is representing each half reaction. Now the, there's a couple things we have to pay attention to is that if you look on the right hand side it says the oxidation occurs at the anode and the reduction occurs at the cathode. Now remember that the the transfer of electron is really what we're focused on and that's the main part here is, is understanding how the electron is traveling. So as the electron travels and you can see it in this particular picture here, the electron is traveling from the zinc to the copper. Remember that the electron is negatively charged. Negative is going to be attracted to the positive. So with it being attracted towards the copper, we're going to call copper the cathode. The cathode is positive charge. Now since the copper metal is the, act, is the cathode, the zinc is going to be called the anode. As you can see it's here is negative. And so that's something you have to pay attention to is you have to really understand what direction is the electron going to travel. 
once you understand that then you can determine what the cathode and anode are so once even one electron flows from the anode to the cathode the charges in each beaker would not be balanced and the flow of electrons would stop so therefore we're going to be using a salt bridge so the salt bridge is this u-shaped tube here the salt bridge is important because it does two different things the first thing is it keeps the charges balanced on both sides of the beaker so when we look at this so the electron travels towards the the copper what happens here is that it's going to form uh, more positive charges in the solution actually it's going to form it's going to pull the copper atoms from the solution onto the metal and it's going to leave the solution being more negative charged from the the anion that's in the solution and so what has to happen is the the anion in order to keep the charges balanced on both sides the anion is going to travel through the salt bridge to the other side now on the other side since we're we're losing the electron we're forming positive ions and so to, to keep that charge balance the same on on this side compared to the other side in relation to positive charge the positive charge is going to have to travel to the other side and so you can see that the sodium is what travels and the nitrate travels because the sodium is not going to react and the nitrate is not going to react so so the salt bridge does two things the first thing is it keeps the charges balanced on both sides the second thing is is that it also completes the circuit without the salt bridge you wouldn't have any form of, of, of current traveling through so it's almost like having a switch turned on and off if you have the salt bridge not present then the switch is off but once you put the salt bridge in it's like turning the switch on and then you have the you, you're able to measure the voltage so and that's the other part here in this this setup is you have a voltmeter the voltmeter's only purpose is to measure the voltage that's passing through it and that's representative of what metals are present now in this example here we see that the zinc and the copper gives off a voltage of 1.10 volts so as we start to you know under trying to understand why that voltage is there uh, we first need to make sure we understand what the voltaic cell slash galvanic cell is composed of and how we set it up so uh, this particular picture here shows just the flow of electrons from one side to the other side this pours barrier here is the salt bridge the salt bridge allows for for ions to travel across keep the 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 charges balanced so as as we start to discuss what the charges are and how we determine the voltage of the cell we have to also understand that the electron is going to only travel in one direction it's just like water flowing down a waterfall it's only going to go in one direction it's never going to go in the opposite direction once the water travels down it stays down and continues on its path so the electrons only flow spontaneously in one way and that is from higher to lower potential energy this goes back to your activity series from chemistry one where you have the most active element versus the least active element so the potential difference between the anode and cathode in a cell is called the electromotive force or it also is called the potential so we represent that by E cell now the cell potential is measured in voltage so we need to make sure we understand the conversion factor because voltage itself is energetic 
and it has units of joules per coulomb. So one volt is equal to one joule, joule per coulomb. Joule is your energy value and coulomb represents the charge that's being transferred by those electrons. So as we move into discussing the cell potentials and how we determine the overall cell potential, we need to look at the standard reduction potentials table. And in this table, what you see here is the, a whole bunch of numbers. But if we look at the lithium, which is on the bottom, and we look at the fluorine, which is on top, the lithium is on the bottom, and lithium is the most active element on the periodic table. Fluorine is the least active metal, or element in this case, on the periodic table. It don't have to necessarily be a metal, it could, but... In this case, fluorine is not metal, it's just a compound. It's the least active metal, or I keep saying metal, element. So if we compare sodium and lithium, lithium has a, a much smaller potential compared to the sodium. So when we talk about the cathode and the anode, the cathode typically will have a more positive voltage and the anode is going to be the one with the more negative voltage or the smaller value for the reduction potential. So if we were to have a, a reaction, a battery composed of sodium and lithium, well the sodium would be the cathode and the lithium would be the anode. Now lithium is a more active element. It's lower on the chart. So that's something you got to be careful and try to understand is that the, the further down the chart you go, the more negative you are, the more likely you're going to be an anode. The higher you are in this chart, the more likely you're going to be the cathode because you're least active. So, so the, the further down you go, the more active you are. So lithium being the anode and cathode being the sodium now we are able to establish what's going to happen in the cell as we set it up so since sodium is the cathode the electrons are going to transfer from the anode to the cathode now why is that important because that's how we're going to set up our equation to calculate the overall cell potential so notice that the the potentials here so record those two potentials for sodium and lithium. Now the values that you see in that chart are determined from the standard hydrogen electrode. And so it's a, it's the, the she is a reference and it's, it's a reference of zero volts. So all the half reactions that you observe there are based around this standard hydrogen electrode. So as we start to talk about the, how to calculate the cell potential for a, a galvanic cell, this is the equation that we can use. And so now the potential that we measured for the, for the two that we just paid attention to, all right, so we had lithium and sodium. All right, sodium we said was the cathode. And the cathode is negative 2.71 volts. And as we look at the anode, now the, the table, that's a reduction potential table. The, what's actually happening in the lithium is it's being oxidized. So we need to reverse the charge and that's where you put this in. So it's equal to negative, negative 3.05. So all you got to remember is to just change the charge of, of the anode and you're fine. So when you plug this in your calculator, you end up getting 0.34 volts. So if we were to, have, to measure the voltage at 25 degrees Celsius, we would obtain 0.34 volts. Okay, so we just finished an example that dealt with sodium and lithium. 
Let's go back to the example we were talking about previously with the copper and zinc metals. So this is the picture we showed you in the previous slide. And we saw that the copper is the cathode and the zinc is the anode. And the electrons travel towards the copper. And so now when we look at the potentials for both of these, all right, we, if you look at, find your appendix in your textbook, and you'll see the table, the standard reduction potentials table. So for copper, you got to be careful because the copper here is a copper plus two and the metal is copper. So you have to find the half reaction that has copper plus two plus two electrons yields copper solid. That one in your is right around plus 0.337 volts on the PowerPoint point three four it really depends on which book you look at and the source. But either way, the re reduction potential for the copper is 0.34 volts. Now the reduction potential for the zinc is negative 0.76 volts. So as we talked earlier, we know that zinc is the anode and so the anode is going to be oxidized. So what do we need to do with the reduction potential for that? Well, uh, when you want to calculate the E cell, we have the plus 0.34 volts. All right. And then we have to change the sign for the zinc because it's being oxidized. That's going to be plus point. 76 volts we're going to get 1.10 volts for the potential for the copper and the zinc galvanic cell so so that is that is how you operate with determining a galvanic cell how to determine the cell potential and the basic setup for a galvanic cell so one thing you got to be careful with and i want to make sure i say this now is that even when you balance the half reactions the electrons in this case are two electrons you do not ever multiply the reduction potentials by anything more than one you don't it's not like other problems where you take the balanced equation and you multiply it by two or three or four because that's what the balanced equation says. In this particular case, you take the numbers as they are and you apply them in the cell potential equation so that way you can determine the cell potential. So in the next video, we will look at free energy and cell potential and how they are related to each other. And we'll, we'll finalize that with the Nernst equation. Thanks for watching.